name is Gary McKechnie. I'm the author of the book Great American Motorcycle Tours, and uh, this is a good one. This is, in fact, this is a great one. MotorQuest, as you know, goes all over the world. Now, here's one that's a little bit closer to home. It's in America. It is. It is the Trail of Lewis and Clark Adventure. And what's great about this is not only do you get to follow in the path of two of history's greatest uh, uh, adventurers, you get to do it without a passport. If you live in America, you just need your driver's license, get on a motorcycle with MotorQuest, and then take off on this wonderful trip that you're looking at. We're going to be joined today by Phil Freeman, the founder of MotorQuest, and Jim Cole, who is an archaeologist who has worked along the path of Lewis and Clark. So this is going to be exciting. This is going to be a great time to get your questions answered about this ride, uh, where you're going to travel, what you're going to see. Uh, first, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, when I wrote my book, Great American Motorcycle Tours, I sold my house and I took a couple of years to travel around the country. And when I look at the map that you were just looking at, I see that I covered a lot of the same ground, not in the same route, but I covered a lot of the same area. And I got to tell you, when I look at that map, my tail starts wagging because it's really an exciting place. When you get west of the Mississippi and the land just opens up for miles and miles and you've got the Rocky Mountains, you've got Great Plains and Valleys, you've got Idaho, you've got Oregon, you've got Washington, it just really stirs your soul and it gets you, uh, it gets you excited to be out there at a place where there's you know, no strip malls, no subdivisions, no gated communities. It's just you and America. And I think that's what you're going to be looking for when you get out there on this Lewis and Clark Trail. Now I want to uh, bring in Phil Freeman. And Phil, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell everybody about the mission of MotorQuest and uh, then tell them why you developed this Lewis and Clark ride. Well, um, yeah, I founded uh, MotorQuest back in 1998. And uh, as you know, uh, we go all over the world and <laughs> Uh, we were trying to think of something that would be more of the domestic nature of uh, riding. And um, uh, the Lewis and Clark uh, story is uh, really a, a true epic. And um, I, I read Stephen Ambrose's uh, Undaunted Courage, and I read it again right after I was done. And it really inspired me. And so I, start, I got with uh, two friends, uh, Lynn Brown and uh, Ron Spencer and we talked about putting together a possible ride and they were both from the area and uh, they were Lewis and Clark of Ficcionados and we uh, put together uh, a fantastic trip that would include uh, 12 days of riding not only amazing riding but standing in the foot uh, uh, the very places that Lewis and Clark went and so if anybody's familiar with that book Stephen Ambrose's Undaunted Courage uh, then you know uh, how exciting that is and to be able to ride the same area uh, and uh, learn a, a little bit about the uh, the history there uh, is is an awesome um, way to uh, join uh, the book uh, and the story with your own uh, personal uh, touch and uh, we got lucky because uh, one of our staff guides uh, Jim Cole is uh, also an archaeologist and uh, Take it away, Jim. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your history and background with uh, Lewis and Clark. Well, actually, I no longer do archaeology, but out of college, I spent about five years working as an archaeologist, and most of that entailed working in the discipline of historical archaeology, which is everything that is within the written record. So for the United States, west of the Mississippi River, that is pretty much... 200 years and pretty much starts with the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, I worked along the trail there. We spent every summer about a month, month and a half at the lower portage and upper portage site uh, right at Great Falls, outside of Great Falls, Montana. And then we would travel to Astoria and work right at Fort Clatsop as well. In between, we would go back to the museum and spend the rest of the winter time cataloging artifacts and writing reports and writing grants to get more money to fund further digs along the expedition trail. Now, Jim, let me ask you a, a quick question because you're, you're a, a scientist. What is it about Stephen Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage, and I understand that 
if if you're a MotorQuest rider, you get a complimentary copy of the book uh, to to take along with you. What is it about that book uh, that makes it so special? Does it does it really capture the spirit of what Lewis and Clark went through? Uh, does does it, did it shine any new light on their adventure or what, what is it about it that, that just makes it so popular and a bestseller? You know, what it really is, is basically that Stephen Ambrose is just a great presenter. The Journals of Lewis and Clark entail a 13 volume, um, 13 mm -hmm. volumes of work between Lewis's journals, Clark's journals, Driard. Ga Patrick Gass and all of the other members of the expedition and so to read all of the actual journals gets a little dry at times and is really a little over comprehensive for what one person would want to do typically. There's also a couple of various um, versions of the journals that are smaller but what uh, Stephen Ambrose was able to do was really personalize and make it accessible for everyone to be able to see what was going on and really identify with, especially focused on Meriwether Lewis, but as well and Clark and all of the other members of the Corps of Discovery. Now, now, now you mentioned the word accessible. He made it accessible. And I have a feeling that's what Phil uh, and, and you have been able to do. You've made what was like a two year I believe they were they it was two years or more did it take yeah. them so so you've condensed that to to a, a shorter amount of time and made it accessible for motorcyclists so give me some of the highlights just a thumbnail sketch some of the highlights of the the original Lewis and Clark expedition and then I'll ask you to talk about some of the highlights of this trip we'll go day by day and you can explain to the folks who are watching uh, what they're going to experience on this. So, so let's start in 1803, I believe it was, and uh, talk about some, you know, two or three highlights of that uh, expedition as they, they marched to the Pacific Coast. Yeah, well, they started in 1803, leaving from Camp Wood River in uh, Illinois and heading out of St. Louis, then up to the present day site of Mandan, North Dakota, where they set up Fort Mandan and spent their first winter. Uh, from that point, they traveled across over the Missouri River to Great Falls and hit the Great Falls of the Missouri River, which, of course, they were unable to continue on up with the boat, so they ended up going and they spent 16 days at the lower ported site basically putting together, creating canoe, dugout canoes and portaging all their materials nine miles around the falls. Oh, and then another 12 days on the other side, getting everything back together and so they could continue on with the, along the trail. Uh, from there, we, they continued across over to Lolo Pass. They, of course, this is where it gets exciting in the book, talking about how they were able to find how to actually get across, and it really ended up being a lot of happenstance luck and good fortune in they had hired an interpreter who, for all accounts, um, I think Clark put it as a man of no general merit, useful as an interpreter only. But on the plus side, he had an incredible young Shoshone bride for a wife who went along with them, who was basically able to guide them along and interpret with the different tribes. And when they went to cross the Lolo Pass, right before they got to the Lolo Pass, they met up with her, her uh, original tribe of Indians and her brother, and they were able to get horses without which they wouldn't have been able to make it. Incredible. Incredible. So, 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 Bill, I have a quick question for you. Is there an extra charge if people want to portage their motorcycles? <laughs> Absolutely. We have an adventure charge for everything. It's a surcharge. <laughs> so, so with, with that, it, it, it fascinates me. And um, I, 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 wearing another hat, I lecture about American history, uh, and I talk about man going to the moon. And a lot of people just think, oh, man went to the moon, and that's all they think about. And so. You know, Jim, when we say, 
well, Lewis and Clark, you know, they left in 1803 and they went to the Pacific Ocean. It's just sort of like, oh, Lewis and Clark just did this. But I think what I hear you implying, it wasn't easy. I mean, this was yeah. a grueling, demanding expedition, uh, almost unparalleled in history. In yeah, the, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, so so the chance, you know, we're, we're living in the lap of luxury, and e even on a motorcycle, which could, could be demanding, I mean, if they had motorcycles, they could have done it a lot quicker, but you were able to capture the essence of that trip in, in this motorcycle journey with MotorQuest. Now, why don't we take it, and Phil, if you want to jump in at any time, and, and let's take it like day by day, and uh, how, how do the riders start, where do they begin, uh, and what are they going to experience as they, they take this journey? Sure. Um, you know, we uh, pick up the bikes in Portland, Oregon, and what we're going to do is 12 days uh, riding uh, all the way to, uh, we're going to go from Portland to Great Falls, uh, Montana, and pick up the Lewis and Clark Trail uh, there where they did the long portage. But before we get there, we're going to go to Lemhi Pass, which is the very first place uh, that the uh, the expedition crossed over um, uh, the Rockies. Uh, right here, we're showing some images. So your first day, you're headed out of Portland, and we have lunch uh, up on, at Mount Hood, and uh, you're already in the mountains and the countryside. It's just fa uh, fabulous um, western um, uh, landscape. And, and Phil, let me ask you a quick question. Looking at some of these pictures, does it take any time for your riders to sort of decompress, or is it almost instantaneous when you get on a road like this and see the waterfalls in, this, in the, the endless sky? Do they get right into the mood and uh, right into the groove of, of the Lewis and Clark adventure? Uh, within minutes, you know, it takes us a few days to catch up with the trail, so we're decompressing just crossing the back roads of Oregon. And uh -huh. uh, I can Please. honestly say that... Uh, some of the best riding I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, it's an unsung hero of great riding. So the first couple of days were just, you know, within minutes we're in Mount Hood at 5,000 feet, and then it's uh, back roads. This is the Deschutes River right here. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the, uh, there's some Native Americans right there. Uh, they're uh, catching uh, steelhead uh, right out of the river with nets, and we actually stayed mm -hmm. the first night right on the Deschutes River uh, at a very nice place, and that's just kind of the the appetizer of what kind of riding you're going to have. And uh, I could speak for some of the groups that have been on this, uh, especially from Europe. They're not used to such wide open Americana type landscapes. Uh, it's very wide open, very beautiful and perfect pavement with absolutely no traffic for the first couple days as we skirt along and we're going to pick up the trail of the Lewis and Clark in a, in a couple days. So this is the kind of stuff you'll be seeing for the first couple days of riding. That's you, you know again if if you if you ride a motorcycle and the people watching this likely do and and whether they're from America Europe uh, Australia Asia I, I think you can look at these <coughs> and, and just sort of tell what a great time you're going to have I think in in addition to the scenery I think there is a camaraderie among riders that uh, when you're riding together and when you when you start at the beginning of the day you meet up again at the uh, end of the day. There's, there's just that, that, that great feeling, again, we can tie that back to Lewis and Clark, uh, that there's a group of people doing something bigger than themselves, and it looks like this is a place that's pretty big. So, so where do they go from the Deschutes okay. River? Sure, sure. Okay, so let's go back to the pictures here. Hmm. Uh, this is uh, through uh, the back roads of Oregon. This is through the John Day fossil area. Actually, if you've ever been there, it's all a uh, pretty dry desert. Uh, the roads are phenomenal. It's one of our longest days. It's over 300 miles. And we end up uh, that day in a small town called Joseph. Here's a picture of the uh, traffic jam in Fossil, Oregon. Um, like I said, these are uh, places that are just very much Americana, uh, you know, uh, farmlands, uh, no traffic, uh, you know, uh, names like Antelope Highway. And really phenomenal, phenomenal riding. So we uh, pull in at the end of the day. We uh, come into an old lodge uh, in Joseph, uh, and, you know, it's right on the lake. It's very beautiful. It's in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And we try to pick these lodges that are uh, a little bit uh, off the main. You know, we don't want brand names if we can get away with it. We want something unique, uh, something with a history if we can do it. And, and we hit Absolutely. it uh, in Joseph here. 
Uh, and then um, as we move through, uh, these are just pictures from that night, but we move on. Oh, those are our parking attendants and Joseph. They're, they're very friendly. <laughs> um, okay, and then the next day uh, we start taking the back roads by Hell's Canyon, and if anybody's ever ridden back there, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's phenomenal. You'll meet more motorcyclists than you will any other cars. And Hell's Canyon itself is a geological wonder, uh, and we go to the rim of that and check it out. Uh, and then further on in the day, we'll uh, drift on down uh, and have a sack lunch right on the Snake River, uh, and it's right between the borders of Oregon and uh, Idaho. And we'll drift along the border, and we'll go into Idaho and end up uh, that evening in McCall in Montana. And if you've ever done any riding there, uh, it's just it just keeps on getting better and better and better. It's it's very phenomenal riding. Now, uh, the next day. Oh, oh let, let me interrupt real quick, Phil. I, I'd like to bring Jim in here. Jim, you've been on this ride several times, uh, I would imagine, and uh, do, do you ever get tired of it? No, definitely not. I mean, like Phil said, this is some of the most incredible riding and, and roads that are just a, a dream highways. Nice twisty turns, hardly any cars. You're getting to see phenomenal scenery, and plus, on this trip, you get all of the added benefit of the historical background that just really ties it all together. And uh, how, how was that? How was that historical knowledge imparted? Do you uh, gather with the group at the end of the day and say, "This is what we're going to see tomorrow," or do you stop along the, the way and say, "This is a historic site and it's historic because X"? Uh, or, or do they just ask you questions, pepper you with questions throughout the ride? Kind of, actually, all of it. I mean, we'll typically, every morning, we'll pull out the map and we'll go over where we're going to be riding during that day and show various areas. But at the same time, we'll also plan on stopping every hour or so. We've figured up uh, basically the best spots to be able to stop and get a rest and use a restroom, get a oh. drink of water and at the same time see something interesting and ideally there's also something we can tell you about that area that we stop. Great, great. Now, now, Phil, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I just wanted to bring Jim in for, for a moment. Um, now, the, these roads obviously are open to the public and I just want you to have a chance to make a pitch for MotorQuest. What is MotorQuest providing? These people could get on these roads and ride them themselves. Uh, what, would, what would be the best uh, benefit for people to, to call you up and get on this ride? Really the benefit uh, is if you don't live on the, uh, if you don't have your motor, own motorcycle, which we have people bring their own motorcycles, mm -hmm. there's all the accommodations, the support, uh, but really it's the, we've gone over the details of the um, historical stops along the way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with Jim on board, uh, especially having been that he's worked on actual digs of actual campsites mm -hmm. and has an in-depth knowledge of the uh, expedition. And everybody on the trip tends to read uh, Stephen Ambrose's uh, book as well, which is really great because it doesn't really kick in until you hit the trail how amazing uh, their story is. And the conversation at the dinner tables will reflect that amongst the people and a deep appreciation collectively will happen. Uh, and then we do, in the mornings we brief and we'll go to the highlights, we'll actually go to places where they stood and and wow. take it in and be able to uh, interpret it for ourselves. So it builds on itself. It's very interesting. So as, if we can move along on the itinerary, I'll show you how it builds. Um, we uh, The next day, we're still cutting across Idaho. So it's it's basically wild river after wild river. And here again, it's it's just the best riding you're ever going to see. And and that's part of the sweetness of this is that we're, we have a mission but we're also just riding, and it's great, great riding. There's no doubt. And as we make it to Salmon, Idaho, everything drifts off and gets a little bit drier, and there's no traffic. And this is where we're going to start picking up the trail. Now, uh, oh. at this point, we're going to catch the expedition on their way uh, west. And this is uh, Salmon, Idaho is where Sacagawea was born. So we we uh, invest two days here, and we go to uh, the Sacagawea Interpretive Center but the real highlight for me, and I know Jim would say so too, is going up to Lemhi Pass, uh, where the expedition actually went over the uh, Rockies. We go to the very spot that the expedition went over the Rockies and into the western 
uh, flowing drainage of the Columbia uh, River system. Uh, and, and it's much like it was a long time ago. Uh, and it's a dirt road. There it is right there. Oh and so God. we take it in, uh, and we bring a sack lunch. Uh, we go down into the trees. There's a little uh, place uh, right near where the Missouri River, the very or original spring of the Missouri River starts. And so That's after it. reading Stephen Ambrose's book, you really it hits you home right now that, wow, they had spent so long just to get to this point. And as you read the story and you understand it, and standing in the same valley as where the Shoshone were, um, you can only wonder how they actually made it and how much luck was involved with them having Sacagawea. And this is where the history really kicks in. So it's not just a motorcycle ride. It's really a profound experience. Uh, so moving on, you're going to see uh, some, some of the original campsites uh, of, the, of the expedition here on this day. And we spent two nights in Salmon so that we can take in all of these uh, historical uh, places. Oh, uh, beautiful road. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then, um, uh, as Jim said, too, the riding just never stops. It just gets better and better and better. Uh, and the following day, we head towards Montana, and that's where Jim's from. And we head – where are we here, Jim? This, this is an interesting place. And for me, this is one of the most important right here. So this is Clark's lookout, and basically this is exactly where he found a high point along the river where he could stop and map out – their journey and so we're looking at right where he was at when he was when he was drawing up the maps well it's handy that compass was there for him to to see yeah <laughs> yeah and on the next picture you're going to see uh what it looked like very much like what he saw you know there is development but there it is folks that's that's the kind of uh area they were seeing when they were pushing their uh canoes up street you know, Phil, that's that's great. I'm glad you pointed that out because you know a lot of people who live in America, 310 million of us, only you know relative handful are, are adventurous enough to to take it on themselves to go out and look at these places to really rediscover America. And I'm I'm really tickled that that's what you do, uh, especially on this MotorQuest journey, is introduce people to American history via two wheels. It's great, great. Yeah, it really didn't hit me uh, until I was at Clark's Point the first time we were scouting it out a couple years ago, how profound this was, and it continues to build. So after we move through Clark's Point, we're going to go on to Butte, Montana at, uh, for the evening. And, and that's an interesting side note anyway, but Montana is very beautiful. Uh, and maybe uh, Jim can add a little bit about what Butte brings to the table. Even though it's not Lewis and Clark, it's it's pretty uh, cool town to stay at. Yeah, so Butte is, Butte around the turn of the century, 1900, was one of the big booming areas. It was referred to as Little San Francisco. And at the time, probably, I think it was like 92 or 93% of the world's copper was coming out of the mine there. The Anaconda, and, I think. Yeah, yeah, the Anaconda Company. And mm -hmm. you'll see the Berkeley Pit, which now is still significant as... Yeah, at least at one point it was the world's largest super fun site, but oh. as well because the economy crashed so hard in Butte, it actually ended up being a major benefit to the area because everywhere else in Montana went through urban renewal and all of the old historic buildings were torn down, everything was rebuilt over the top, but the economy collapsed there and so there was no money to do that and there was no one that was trying to do that so there's still all this fantastic grand architecture the copper king mansions the actual mines you can go up and tour it, and it really is one of the the unsung jewels of montana and jim is that along the lincoln highway is is butte on the lincoln highway butte i think I think that Lincoln Highway is more a lot when you go up to Helena. Okay, very good. I, I was just curious. I've been in that area and I couldn't I couldn't quite remember. Well, Phil, let's let's get back on the road and continue the journey uh, following Lewis and Clark. Sure. Uh, the next day, Jim can take that over because our main mission is to get on to Great Falls. And so, okay. where do we go before that? Uh, so we stop before that, we actually hit Three Forks, Montana, which is 
one of my favorite parts on the, the way because we're actually about 20 miles away from where I grew up in Bozeman. But the significance other than that of Three Forks is that's really the start of what makes the Missouri River. That's where the Gallatin, the Jefferson, and the Madison River come together. And you see the actual Three Forks of the river come together and we can stop and look and there's a really nice pull off with some placards that tell details about Lewis and Clark and just seeing where where they got to and how they saw that oh yeah this is where this is where the the river became the mighty Missouri wow and so they had they stood on that spot is that correct Jim yeah yep. incredible okay and keep, so, for, let's keep going this is great yeah, and from there, we're going to head up towards Great Falls. We actually go back through, like, right along the way that they would have come up there, and we're going, we don't actually stop because it's private land, but we will drive right past where the Lower Portage Camp was, and that's where I spent months of every year for about four years sitting out digging in the dirt looking for artifacts and where they ended up creating all their dugout canoes and their wagons made out of uh, cottonwood wheels in order to haul all of their materials nine miles around the falls. And what, what's the most exciting artifact you found uh, on your digs? Um, probably the most exciting would have been we got an iron push pin, which the speculation is that was from Clark's drawing table from his mapping. Nice. As well, we had a number, of, we had a gun flint, uh -huh. and we had a ton of bison bone because they butchered, I think it was 23 bison there in yeah. order to restock their food supply. Uh, but the biggest thing, what was able to really, so we could say that that was an actual Lewis and Clark campsite, was that we found three fire pits that were all 50 feet apart, which was military regulations at the time. Oh. in a straight line, and they dated to 1,800 plus or minus 20 years, and we know that no one else would have been following military regulations for another about 60 years after Lewis and Clark. How exciting. Boy, I, 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 let's keep going. I'm loving this. Thank you. Yeah, take it, Jim. Uh, tell them where we go from here. Yeah. So from there, we'll go into Great Falls, and Great Falls is another great stop because while the, the actual Great Falls are no longer there, they were dammed up, and so it's that's kind of a disappointment. We do get to see a fantastic uh, Lewis and Clark interpretive center, and it's got, like, in this picture, you can't see it very well, but there's a diorama of what they went through hauling these dugout canoes with all their gear up the mountain. And it's just incredible the fact that these men made it through all this expedition. They had one man died in the first year of appendicitis, but no other major maladies. And they were, I think at this point when they were hauling, portaging things around the Missouri, they were averaging eating about 12 or 14 pounds of meat a day per person in order oh, to what? sustain themselves. <laughs> oh, Super-sized meals. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Oh, my God. And so where do we go from here now? Well, oh. we uh, so we see the Great Falls. Uh, we take in what they did there, uh, the incredible amount of work, and then we start shooting across uh, into Blackfoot country uh, in Montana, and uh, we head uh, to a little town of Ovando, and this is the type of landscape you'll be seeing, uh, big skies, big horizons, and this is right where uh, Lewis and Clark crossed through again. Luckily, they didn't meet the Blackfoot on the other on the way through. This could have changed history as we know it. That's for sure. Uh, they were no off. No one would have known had, had they been killed. Uh, no one would have no um, And then we head on to Traveler's Rest, and this is a place uh, in their journals where they stopped both coming and going. It was a well-known rest spot uh, so that they could uh, refresh their horses and themselves. Uh, this is a place where when they were headed east, they split up. Uh, on, on the way home. Uh, it's a very interesting place. We stay there for a couple minutes and take it all in. And then we head into Lolo's Pass, which is uh, we're not able to actually follow the actual road. 
if you need an off-road motorcycle and ask us if we can put something together, we'd love to. But uh, the road there is what you see, 99 miles of twisty curves. It's one of the best roads you can ever ride. And yeah. if anybody's ever ridden it, you'll know what I mean. And we actually stay out here one night at uh, Loxa Lodge. It's a very nice place. It's uh, very remote in the forest. Uh, and uh, the next day, you're greeted with uh, 90 miles of curves as you're riding through uh, Idaho. It's it's very, very beautiful. Um, Lewis and Clark Expedition actually stayed on the ridge lines, and we actually catch up with them in a little place called Weipe. And you could tell us a little bit about Weipe, Jim. <laughs> All right, now you're putting me on the spot. And so, oh, Weipe. Uh, well, the Nez Pierce. <laughs> yeah, I will. that's right. Weep is where they met up with the Nez Pierce with, um, and again, were able to trade and get their horses to be able to continue on. And from there, then we continue on and head towards Walla Walla and actually meet up with the Columbia River. And that's where we head. Uh, we're just going to go right on the same course as they did, uh, all the way down the Columbia. And so for the rest of the trip, We'll be shadowing the Columbia River, the Columbia River Gorge. You're going to see Mount Hood again, uh, where we had lunch the one day. Uh, and there you have it. It's uh, very, very beautiful stuff. And uh, we uh, we end uh, we stop at an interpretive center in Hood River. It's the Columbia Gorge Interpretive Center, and it also has some very uh, insightful uh, uh, information uh, there for us. In uh, and it's also got, some side roads. And it's got the interpretive center in the dolls is really interesting because they've got a great display that really focuses in on the cargo that they carried on the Lewis and Clark journey and what they had to take with them. The the fascinating part about their expedition was that for two years and two, and four months they basically carried everything they needed with them and didn't waste anything because they didn't have, they weren't, they didn't have any place to be able to get supplies again. They didn't know, they thought they might be able to on the coast meet up with some whalers or some fur traders, but they knew that there wasn't much chance of that. So, so if I'm doing the math right, two years and four months, rough, more than 800 days. And Phil, how many days does this journey take with MotorQuest? Well, we were talking about it earlier. We, we're covering what they did, uh, pushing, you know, from the Columbia River from Great Falls. It took them what f uh, a month. What we do in a day. Yeah. Oh, uh, right. And uh, <laughs> yeah, our our way of going is a lot easier. That's for sure. It doesn't really hit you about how arduous that trip is until you go to the interpretive center and they have some. Um, uh, they have some. Uh, like weightlifting examples there and stuff, and it gives you an idea of what kind of work they were doing, uh, and they were doing it day in and day out. And then you get on your motorcycle, start putting along, going, "How did they do it?" Uh, it's it's pretty profound. Absolutely, and I think I think that's great because you have to understand history uh, to really appreciate the American experience and the American experiment. You know, how do we keep how do we keep this stuff going? But I see there there's some folks here, and if, uh, if they have any questions, I, I'm not sure if we'll be we'd be able to hear them. Uh, John, if we can access them, if anybody uh, tuned in live would like to ask a question, let's see if there's a way to do that. Anyone? Well, we could we could finish off the last couple of days. Just to, we have one more day where we could. Uh, okay. Um. From uh, Hood River, we uh, the last day is along the Columbia River, uh, and we actually dip in uh, by uh, Mount St. Helens, and if anybody's ridden Washington, uh, and on a good day, oh boy, it's a rider's delight, and we uh, get back on uh, track with the Columbia River, and we actually take a small ferry across, uh, and you get a little bit of a glimpse of the you know, just the enormity of the Columbia River, and you can take in its energy. And then we end up in Astoria that day. We get in quite early that day, so we have an option to go on to Cape Disappointment, and that's actually the very place where they were pretty bummed to find out. <laughs> well, 
you could tell about Cape D Disappointment, Jim. So Cape Disappointment is where they first actually saw the ocean, and they thought, oh, man, we're here. We've done it. Only to come to realize that they could see the ocean, but it wasn't really anything where they could stay because they knew that they had to winter over on the coast there before turning around and making the way back. So from Cape Disappointment, they continued on down to present-day Astoria and set up Fort Clatsop, which is another, I think, about 12 or 18 miles of arduous travel when they thought they had finally made it. Amazing. Now, what, what are the reactions after, this is for Jim and Phil, after riders have completed this journey uh, and, and they get to the end, what are some of the comments that they get? Has this been a life-changing experience or just something that burnishes their life, that, that just really gets them energized and recharged? What do you hear from these folks? Um, I could easily answer that. Please. I think number one, and I've ridden with uh, several of these people around the world, uh, and what they say is when you mix the history uh, with the you know the actual writing of the the area, um, there it's unparalleled. It really starts to hit home the story, and the story becomes yours as you continue along the trail. And the longer you are exploring these places, these historical points. Uh, the more you, it becomes part of you. So really, uh, that's what happens on that trip. It's not just a great motorcycle ride. In itself, it's a great motorcycle ride. But you add that element of history, and it actually becomes part of you too because the appreciation is there. So everybody on the trip generally uh, reads the Stephen Ambrose's book, uh, mm -hmm. and then they experience the actual spots they've been, and then this is the comments I hear. I want to go back. I want to they, – they feel like they've really seen the West because we're going to see some scenes that are off the beaten track that are just uh, specifically Americana and Wild West. And um, I was also told that the variety of writing was uh, superior to many of their experiences because you're going to come from the lush green forests uh, on the west side of the Cascade to the dry uh, eastern Oregon. And then Idaho has everything. And then you're going to go to the big sky of Montana. So oh. you're going to see all sorts of environments, elevation changes. And, and we just looked at each other, Jim and I, when we did it last year, and we just said, geez, this day is better than yesterday. And yesterday was the best day. And it just oh. kept going yeah. and going and going. And I think, too, that the type of rider that's interested in this type of camaraderie-based adventure, um, what I found was they bond a lot uh, – more in a more profound way in that around dinner we're not just talking about what you did where you traveled this or that actually the conversation continually drifts back to the um, appreciation for the expedition itself and some anticipation about the story and what we're going to see tomorrow kind of inter you know it interwines with uh, the trip so there's this anticip anticipation about oh geez tomorrow we're going to Fort Clatsop, you know, and then you just start getting excited because you've been talking about it for days oh. and it's building on itself. So it's it's really a spectacular ride, but it's and it's it's an experience is what it is. That's great. And Jim, I see while while Phil's talking, I see you in the inset picture smiling. You're just beaming like you you want to do this right now. And Absolutely. Uh, and I and I would imagine you hear a lot of the same comments that Phil hears that that uh, this is really an adventure and a bonding experience. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's one of the things about just doing motorcycle tours in general. It seems no matter where I've guided and what, what tours I've done, you go in the first day, meet new people, and within a day or two, you've got lifelong friends. And this one in particular, it's just really interesting to be able to put it into the context of the history mm -hmm. and to be able to place yourself in the American story. Great. Great. Well said. And uh, and I was premature uh, inviting uh, some of the folks watching live to, to ask questions, and, and I'll, I'll uh, <coughs> consult with our tech guy, John, uh, to, to see if, if we can bring in people either uh, via a type chat or, or if they can ask questions live. 
And if, uh, or Phil, if you know if, if, if how that's done, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we're all technically illiterate here. But it is, let me ask you this, is there anything that we didn't cover, Phil or Jim, that, that we need to cover for the folks who are watching this either live or are going to see it uh, later uploaded on YouTube and available online? The one thing that I would say is, going back to what you had asked before, in that during this tour, in the course of 12 days, we're basically tracing out the Lewis and Clark expeditions year from June of 1805 to about July of 1806. Mm -hmm. So in 12 days, we're doing 12 months worth of travel. Granted, mm -hmm. part of that was when they were weathered in at Astoria wow. over the winter and reading the journals and as you read the Undaunted Courage, you'll see how how much they didn't really like or appreciate that because they spent a couple of months, three, four months, just being wet the entire time living on the coastal rainforest. But it's just incredible to think that what we're able to do in modern times in the span of under two weeks uh -huh. to make up what they did in a year. And, you know, as a personal note, a couple of years ago, I was, I was very privileged to uh, be the rider slash writer uh, for the Cannonball Centennial Ride. And I rode from San Diego to New York City in 11 and a half days uh, in recognition uh, of Irwin Cannonball Baker, who did the same thing, but he did it in 1914 yeah. and on a seven horsepower Indian. <laughs> and it, it, is, it, it is really ex exciting when you're following in the footsteps or tire tracks, I suppose, of somebody who did it 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and you wonder, how? How did they do this? And you have this respect. And so I think it, that also seeps into your life because you think it, it, when you come up on some obstacle you can't think you can overcome, and then you think, well, if Lewis and Clark did it or if Cannonball Baker did it, you know, I can do this, whatever that happens to be. So I think it's, it's, it's a lot of, like, you know, uh, it's like a motivational course as well, in addition to being a motivational course, <laughs> you know, to get out there and do this. But, uh, boy, we've been talking. Uh, time flies. But I'm going to leave the last word with Phil. Phil, I want you to um, wrap things up for us and tell us uh, in, in your own words, nobody else's, of course, uh, about this trip and how people can uh, uh, sign up and learn more about it and get on the, the next ride with uh, Lewis and Clark and Jim Cole. Okay, well, I, I kind of I want to take the angle of just being a human and trying to learn as much about history and who we are and how we develop. And uh, we stop at a place called the Big Hole Battle Interpretive Center. I've been there, yes. It's a place where the Nez Pierce were on the run. Um, it's years after they had saved the Lewis and Clark expedition. And it's not a, I would say, it, it's not a happy place. It's a place uh, just to uh, reflect on what humans are. And Lewis and Clark were the first to make it and make contact with some of these tribes. Uh, and they were very lucky to even pull this off when you, when you take into, uh, uh, you know, account all of, the, all of the tough stuff that they had to do. But right. the big hole brings it home in that, you know, we're human. What is it to be human? And the West, uh, the American West, was uh, very much a uh, wide open and very dangerous and uh, a beautiful land. And it is still very beautiful. And so you get to, you touch on just not only the Lewis and Clark expedition, but the history of, of humans in general. And also you superimpose this with the backdrop of the beauty of the West. And it's, it's a lot. You know, it's not just a ride. It's, it's an, a learning experience. And, Phil, the, the, the footnote of that at Big Hole National Battlefield uh, is that the, the Nez Pierce had, had tried to evade the U.S. Army for months, and they got there, and it was where Chief Joseph, I believe, said, uh, hear me now, um, my heart is weary and sad. From, where, uh, from where, I, uh, where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Um, I mean, it was just tragic what uh, the, the U.S. did to the Nez Perce and other Indian tribes, uh, especially those who, who assisted Lewis and Clark in opening up the West 
uh, to development in our in our manifest destiny. Uh, it, it's it, it's an exciting ride. I can I can just look at the map and my heart starts pounding because you 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 want to go back and follow in their footsteps. But uh, Jim and Phil, boy, I really appreciate you taking us around America and especially this part of America because uh, the Louisiana Purchase, you know, increased. The, the size of the nation by two thirds, and it took you know Thomas Jefferson, Lewis and Clark, and uh, that that uh, band of adventurers to to make it out west with the help of uh, Native Americans. And uh, well, Phil, thanks to you and Jim and others at MotorQuest, you're you know you you're opening that door for people today to to be able to follow in their footsteps. And and I think that's something that everybody everybody who rides a motorcycle, everybody who has a quest for adventure. Uh, they they should do. Uh, any last words, Phil? Any last words, Jim? I would just say join us. Uh, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful ride. Uh, we keep the group small from eight to twelve participants. Um, it's very boutique. It's, uh, it's fun. The people that are attracted to this ride are fun loving, fearless folk mm. that make friends forever. Uh, that's what I'd say. Come to come join us in September, uh, Jim. Yeah, same thing. I would just say, yeah, if you're interested, go to the MotoQuest website and look up the details on the tour and shoot us an email. I mean, we would love to have you join us on the ride. Wonderful. Jim, Phil, uh, thank you both very much. Uh, now I have to go read Undaunted Courage and come up to speed on this, and, uh, and I really appreciate it. And for those of you who were watching live, and who are going to watch this uh, online later. Thank you very much. Check out MotorQuest's website, and uh, we'll hope to see you on the road. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Jim.